Shauna and I are going to really try hard to remember to record. So if anyone sees we're not recording, you could also shout us out for that because that is not our strong suit. Um, so again, welcome everyone. We're very excited to be here with you. Um, I got to listen into the morning, the what is that called? The opening session this morning um, with Karen Pittman talking about the science of learning and development and the blue wheel. So this in a way is a follow-up to what she was referencing frequently in her, in her remarks, which were as always amazing. Um, so Shauna and I are gonna talk more in more depth about the science of learning and development and then what that means for your practices um, around the blue wheel. So uh, I'm Katie Brackenridge. I'm with Turnaround for Children. And I know some of you from my past life uh, at the Partnership for Children and Youth. And uh, before that, another 10 years in expanded learning programs. So um, my heart and soul has always been in after school and summer programs. And I transitioned to this work at Turnaround for Children because I was super excited about the science that I'm gonna share with you in a few minutes. Because of the way that science validates all of these youth development practices I had been doing my entire career. And I just think it's really, really cool that there's a biological reason that those things work. So I'm gonna share that with you and I'm gonna let Shauna introduce herself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited to be here today with Katie, one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, yes, I have to echo that sentiment regarding the science really kind of underscoring and um, illuminating all the stuff that I knew felt good for me as a classroom teacher and a principal. I'm the executive director at Sacramento County Office of Ed, um, working in curriculum and instruction and um, LCAP accountability, state and federal program stuff. So I get to do a kind of a mixed bag of things, but my heart really lies with the social emotional learning work um, and trauma informed practice. Um, I come at this from kind of basically also the, the research side as well as the practitioner side. I was a researcher at the Learning Policy Institute and was one of the uh, lucky researchers who got to actually help develop that blue wheel. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to share with you a little bit about the various aspects of that um, and, and provide some space for folks to chat about implications for practice, which is, I think, the most exciting part, right, where we can find that bridge between research and practice and policy. So that's a little about me. Thanks, Jonna. Great. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us on a little bit of a triggering trip here through the past year. Um, we, none of us can forget that we're in a pandemic and have been for over a year. We also had a crazy spate of police brutality, or maybe I should just say police brutality being noticed and brought to the forefront. We lived through the wildfires and we kicked off our year with an, an attack on our capital. So it is no wonder that many of us feel like this. And while things are maybe looking a little bit brighter, we still have a lot of lingering stress and trauma from all of the things we've experienced over the past year. So we wanted to start this conversation because we are gonna be talking about the impact of stress on the brain, um, having you think a little bit about how this past year of crises has impacted you and what some of the supports and strategies you've used to cope, because we know you have resources and you've been using those resources and assets to, to support yourself through this difficult time. Um, and we also want you to think a little bit about how you think all of these things have impacted the young people that you work with. So Shauna's gonna put you right away into breakouts. You'll have two other people in there, two or three other people in there with you. And you're gonna have about six minutes to have this quick conversation. And all right, welcome back everybody. I hope you had good conversations. I know when you get whip, whipped out at the, in the middle of a sentence, it's kind of unnerving. Um, I would love to get some of your supports and strategies shared out. So you can either do that in the chat box or if you're feeling brave, you can come off of mute and share 
uh, what some of the strategies and supports you use are. I know some of you and I know you're not shy. So I would also just take this moment to invite you to come off mute and share. And at any time in the presentation, if you have a question, just jump in and ask the question or stick it in the chat box and Shauna will say out loud there's somebody with a question. But for right now, I invite you to either put it in the chat box or if you're feeling like it, come off mute and share what some of the supports and strategies you use to cope with stress and the stress we've been feeling. I can go. Surprise, surprise. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I feel like for me, luckily, a, a year or two before the pandemic hit, I started getting into meditation and learning about Kriya Yoga and the spiritual side of, you know, just that concept of oneness and wholeness that we all are. And um, so that has been a huge, I, I was just sharing in my group that I've, I, I currently now believe anything is possible because I've seen the changes in myself and things that I would have said before are not possible okay. um, are changes I've made and, and it's, and it's not hard. It's not challenging. It's, it's um, so I, I currently now believe anything is possible. And for me, it really comes down to the, you know, meditation practices and you know, self-study and, um, and self-discipline and um, yeah, I trust faith that, that things will work out as they're supposed to. And yeah, so those have been some of my biggest, That's my great. life is completely changing and I'm, and I'm super grateful that this whole thing happened as horrible as it's been. <laughs> Wow, Mandy, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anyone else want to share out loud or stick it in the chat box? I noticed my chat box is very empty. I want to share. Thank you so much, Rocky. Sure. Um, I've been reminded to use my breathing tool because um, I'm telling other people to do it. So now it's like, okay, well, then I should probably be using it. So, and it really does work. So that and um, it's supported me to come into work and to meet with my work partners to have that distance connection, but nonetheless to have it. And then the last thing that's shown up for me uh, during this time is to focus on self-compassion, to give myself a break, to allow myself to, to fail or to mm -hmm. not do, you know, to not meet my expectations. And to just not go bad on myself the way that sometimes I can. So that's been a support. That's great. That's really great to hear. So oftentimes people share when they're willing to put it in the chat box. We're all so like Zoom weary, like put it in the chat box. Maybe you're all done with that. But anyway, usually people share things like this, the meditation practices, the breathing tool. They share things like um, relationships and getting support from their family and their good friends. They talk about going on walks together. So I'm guessing that's what came up in some of your conversations. Um, and it's wonderful, right? As adults, we have a lot of these resources and there are things that are helping you to cope with this situation. that are helping you to um, have the calm brain that you need in order to focus and do the tasks that you're required to do. This is what the science says. This is true for kids. The path to learning is a calm brain. And while you as adults have many of the skills there are many of our students who may not yet have those skills. So as we think about kids returning to school, as you think about um, this funding opportunity, um, this workshop is really about helping think through what are the supports we need to put in place so kids can have that calm brain for learning. There is no world in which kids are going to come back into the learning space in person and just be able to sit down and let us cram in all of that content we think they've missed. We are gonna need to set the context for them to be able to do that learning because that's the way our brains work. So today, that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the science of learning and development and what, what it says about the need to integrate academic, social, and emotional content learning. Um, Shauna's gonna talk you through the blue wheel, the whole child design um, which translates the science into practice. And then you're gonna have some time to talk with each other about what this means for your practice. 
So that's the scheme in the agenda for all of you from the expanded learning world. Uh, this is actually not necessarily new information. When we get to the blue wheel, you're going to see how familiar it is um, because many of these practices were already part of our quality standards for expanded learning because they are youth development practices. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir right now because those of you from expanded learning know this extremely well. Um, and I would just do a shout out if there's anyone on the phone, on the phone, on the call today who is in the K, only in the K-12 space, just this is a shout out to look to your expanded learning partners because we've been working on this for literally for decades. <laughs> um, so youth development, practice, whole child design are very much integrated. And they are, as you probably all know, also captured in the local control funding formula priorities. So what we're talking about is um, possibly new in the practice realm, but has certainly been part of the vision for what education should be for quite a while. And so we're going to dive into that with uh, understanding how our brains work. So there are three things you need to know. The first is that the brain is malleable. The second is that it grows and changes over our lifetime, and it does so in response to our context. And this is a little bit different than what people used to believe. In the 1970s, we believed that kids' brains were pretty much fully developed by the time they were five years old. But technology has allowed us to see through brain scans that actually our brains keep changing over our entire lifetime. And that's happening at the levels of, level of our genes. So we actually have 20,000 genes in our genome, but less than 10% of them ever get expressed. So what determines which genes get activated? It's because our genes are little packets of protein that respond to the physical and social cues around us. So those cues actually indicate to the genes whether they should turn on or not which means that the context, those physical and social cues, are the primary drivers of who we become. And by context, we're talking about the experiences, the environment, and the relationships that we have. And our brains, it turns out, are made of tissue, and our brains are the organ in our bodies that are most uh, susceptible to our outward environment. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing because when the environment is difficult, it creates significant challenges for us. Adversity isn't something just that happens to children, it's actually something that happens inside their brains and bodies. And that's happening um, in the limbic system of our brains, which you probably know is made up of the prefrontal cortex, which is around attention and concentration and focus, and the hippocampus, which is about learning and memory, and the amygdala, which is about our emotion, emotional reactions. Um, these three parts of our brain pretty much need to be in balance for us to be able to, to learn. What happens when we experience stress, like we have over the past year, is that we receive cord the hormone cortisol, which interacts with our amygdalas and triggers our emotional responses. This can be a good thing, right? So it's, it's adaptive in that when we need to do something that is uh, difficult, like giving a presentation, it helps us to be alert and ready to perform, or maybe, you know, being on a sports team when you're going out on the pitch, it's, it's great if you have a little bit of uh, reactivity in your system. And obviously it is also important if you're in real, real danger, this cortisol is what triggers your fight, flight or freeze response. So it can be helpful. The problem is if kids are experiencing high levels of cortisol over a long period of time, and it's unbuffered, it actually gets your amygdala um, uh, overactive. It means your amygdala is primed to, to recognize danger even when there isn't danger. So sometimes you may have interacted with kids or adults who seem to have like 
huge reactions to something that's even a, a small transgression. They may have overactive amygdalas, um, and therefore what they're experiencing is actually something they consider truly dangerous. They have gone into fight, flight, or freeze, even though other people might not experience it that way. That's because their system may be experiencing high levels of cortisol on an ongoing basis, which has kept their brains out of balance. The good news is that we also release the hormone oxytocin. And that hormone gets released when we're experiencing trust and positive relationships. So this is what uh, happens when, if you're having an issue or a challenge and you call a friend and have a conversation and at the end you feel better, it's because you got an actual hormone released, you got oxytocin that helped you calm down. And even a smile from a friend, even a smile for yourself gives you oxytocin. That's why you feel better when, you're, when you have those experiences. And oxytocin directly counteracts cortisol. So this is the really cool thing that got me so excited is that what we knew instinctually, what we knew from the research about relationships and supportive environments is totally backed up by the science of how our bodies actually work. This is a chemical reaction that we're triggering when we do things like intentionally set up relationships and make sure that environments are supportive. Um, so as we think about kids coming back to school with us or coming back into program with us, how do we create um, experiences, how do we create the context that releases as much oxytocin as possible to help counteract the experiences kids have been having. And unfortunately, those experiences have been really isolating, right? People have been alone <laughs> for a very long time at the period in their lives or in the situation when they most needed interactions with other people, when they most needed um, the, that boost of oxytocin, but we haven't had those opportunities until now. So as kids are coming back into learning spaces, into program spaces, how do we create the context that help them to do uh, what they need to do in terms of continuing to learn and develop? Because what we know is that there is no such thing as a developing child independent of context. So I'm going to tell you a story about that. You guys have probably heard about the marshmallow test. It was a test done in the 1970s at Stanford University. The researcher wanted to look at the trait of uh, delayed gratification. So he took a group of toddlers and he gave them each a marshmallow. And he said, if you can wait until I come back and not eat that marshmallow, I will give you a second marshmallow. And then he looked at the difference in long-term outcomes between the kids who were able to wait, who showed this trait of delayed gratification, and the kids who gobbled up the marshmallow right away. And what he found was those kids who'd showed delayed gratification, who waited for the second marshmallow, actually had much better long-term outcomes. They graduated from high school at a higher rate, they had higher GPAs, um, they finished college, all of those indicators of, of success in our culture, they did better. And the conclusion that was drawn from this experiment at the time was that there is a fixed trait of delayed gratification. And if you have it, you're gonna do better in life. Fast forward to 2012 and a researcher at the University of Rochester who also worked in a homeless shelter was curious about how her kids would do in this marshmallow test. So she recreated the test, the experiment with a twist. First, she, she brought her toddlers together. Um, they, she put them each in a room. She said, hey, let's do an art project together. And she gave them this set of broken crayons. And then she said, wait a second, we just got all these new art supplies. I'm gonna leave the room. I'm gonna come back in a minute with a new set of crayons. For half of the kids, she came back with that beautiful new set of crayons. And for the other half, she came back and she said, I'm so sorry, but we don't have those crayons anymore. So it's okay, you can use these broken crayons. And at the end of our art project, she said, hey, here's a marshmallow. 
if you can wait until I come back and not eat your marshmallow, <laughs> I'll give you a second marshmallow. And what she found was that the kids who were in the reliable group, the kids who had gotten the new set of crayons were four, waited four times more minutes for the second marshmallow than the kids in the unreliable group. They waited 14 minutes, did not eat their marshmallow. They waited 14 minutes for that second marshmallow while the kids in the unreliable group who hadn't gotten new crayons um, ate their marshmallows quite quickly. So if we think about what that means, um, the kids in the unreliable group were making a logical decision based on the context that they were in, based on the experience that they had just had with that researcher. That context determined which traits they were, which qualities they were willing to reveal. There's no such thing as a developing child independent of context. Our context determines what we're willing to share, what we're willing to do. So if we think about that in terms of our programs and our schools, what is the context that we can set that supports children in revealing their best traits and assets? And that's what we do. We are all brain builders who create the context for kids to show, show their stuff, to help them reveal the qualities that help, are going to support them in all of their learning and development. So I've been talking for a really, really long time and I wanna give you a chance to um, process some of this. So we're actually gonna go back into our breakout rooms and I have a scenario for you that's probably gonna sound a little bit familiar. Um, so imagine you're talking to a colleague who says, our kids are so far behind, we just need to get them in their seats and learning. There's no time to mess around with games and silliness. So imagine you're talking to someone, maybe it's someone in the school district, maybe it's a colleague um, who is feeling this stress around the learning loss our kids have experienced. What might you uh, say to them? What would the science say about this approach? So Shauna's going to put you in, I think we said the same breakout groups, and you'll have another six minutes. All right, so I know you are having good conversations because you all came back in one flood. <laughs> and I know the breakout room was too short, but um, this gives Shauna and me a chance to hear a little bit about what you were talking about. So what were some of your reflections in your breakout rooms it, and or any questions that came up that you wanna shout out now? Questions about the science or just reflections on that scenario? I, I had a, a, a couple of ahas. I mean, we, we talk about inequity as if it just happens, right? This is where inequity kind of seeds and germinates. You know, when we uh, prioritize something as most important, like standards and curriculum and pacing calendars over things that are actually uh, at best equally important, but in my own mind, definitely most important, which is connection. Um, uh, uh, and what we're defining here as context. And uh, we get to help create the context. And what we also discuss is that oftentimes when you take the time to connect, um, young people will uh, help guide you in teaching them uh, uh, by helping to identify the ways they learn, the things that uh, make them excited and interested and lean in and those types of things. Thank you so much, Tommy, right? It, this is not an either or situation, right? The two, that's, that's the way our brain works. The two are, the three are super interconnected um, and you leverage one for the other. And that is how learning happens for, frankly, for all of us, right? Other reflections, thanks, Tommy. While we're waiting for someone to come off mute, Shauna, do you want to share what you yeah. said about the reliable on, well, both, both your comments in our little breakout were fabulous. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, I was just, it, I, it occurred to me this connection to what we know about um, motivation and the 
theories around motivation in, in that, you know, sometimes relationships become the bridge between helping a kid get from extrinsic motivators to intrinsic motivation, right? So I, I use the example of like, okay, Katie is my science teacher and I really don't like science. I don't feel good at it. I don't like it, but I like Katie and she's nice to me and she's kind to me and she cares about me and I feel safe in her classroom. And so I'm going to show up to her science class, even though I don't like science. And sure enough, I might be more inclined to take a risk and like try and actually study and maybe do a homework assignment or two or three. And before you know it, I'm going from maybe getting D's and F's to maybe a C and maybe I get an A minus on something and I'm shocked. And pretty soon I'm starting to incorporate being a scientist into my identity, into who I am and how I see myself. And pretty soon I am coming to class on my own you know, motivation and I want to learn and I want to push and I love the kids. Um, <laughs> and, and so just like thinking about how that relationship that can, can be the thing that gets a kid into the room to even try and, and, and engage in that work. And um, yeah, just thinking about that. Thanks so much, Shauna. Sorry, I got a little, <laughs> I got a little <laughs> distracted by Mandy's mini me. <laughs> Um, are there any other thoughts? Yeah, Katie, I'm happy to jump in and, um, you know, share a little, uh, insight. Like we've, we've had at Edmo with, with our own staff, right? Like we're not that different from kids, right? We're, we're not at all. And, right. And so it's like, when we do our team meetings now, uh, pretty much our almost out of an hour and a half, almost an hour of it is all about connecting with each other finding times to get silly with each other, play the same kind of games that we do with the kids, we do with each other, uh, celebrate birthdays, whatever it is, it's like all about connection. And um, we've had several staff that we hired during this pandemic who've never actually seen some of their you know, uh, co-workers in person. Uh, so really just front loading and really prioritizing in our meetings and then saying, hey, all the other little things we can settle during emails or a smaller meeting, but when we're getting together, it's all about connection. And so it's like using that same mentality when we're, you know, working with kids is that's number one priority. The, the learning and things gonna, will happen after we've established connections and, and get to know each other. Yeah. And frankly, only if you establish connections and all of that. Yeah. yeah. Great. So I'm going to move us to talking about the implications for all of this to practice. Shauna's going to share with us that piece. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so we just talked a lot about the science behind all of this. And what are the implications then for our for what we actually do with young people? Fortunately, that's been really nicely defined by that blue wheel and I would say by youth development practice, but I'm gonna stop talking and let Shauna talk about that. Great, thanks Katie. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, just, uh, just another reminder uh, that this is where you're gonna see these uh, quality standards for professional or for expanded learning really show up in our whole child framework that we're gonna walk through uh, right now. So um, Katie, you can go to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned at the top um, of the session, in 2019, with a team of researchers um, at the Learning Policy Institute and Turnaround for Children and AIR, lots of different organizations kind of came together in this effort um, to really try and connect the science that Katie just talked about to the implications for educational practice. In other words, we were trying to figure out, okay, what specific moves, pedagogies, structures might need to be in place or be utilized by adults in schools in order to provide the conditions within which children can learn and develop in this sort of healthy way with a calm brain, with a safe and supportive learning environment. So we're trying to kind of really build that bridge between the science and then the what the educators uh, and adults can do to, to operationalize this in their daily work. Um, and so we identified the following domains that schools should attend to, to ensure this optimal development and learning. So uh, the first is really around positive school climate, right? So uh, where both classrooms and the school as a whole includes an emphasis on safety and belonging, 
through intentional opportunities for students to form those positive developmental relationships. And so I think sometimes we misunderstand this and think, oh, it's just, oh, that's the homeroom teacher, or that's the advisory teacher, or that's the role of the coach, or just this other person in the building. But really, it's actually, how can we think about this as the entire school day, beginning to end, after school, before school care, pre-K, through 12th grade and beyond? Um, the other piece is around um, shaping positive student behaviors through the use of social emotional learning, right, should, which should include explicit and integrated opportunities for building skills, mindsets, and habits that are needed for productive learning and cooperation. So this idea of, is it curriculum and instruction? or relationship building or building these habits and mindsets or is it one first and the other it's actually both simultaneously all the time right because just in the same way that our brains are functionally and structurally integrated to be doing lots of different things all at once our school day and expanded school day have to be set up in this regard as well where there's opportunities to explicitly say hey how do we cooperate with one another when we're on the playground or how might we engage in a group project where we're working on this thing together what's the what are the elements of doing that while also uh integrating that into the academic or the curriculum itself, but then also having it show up in the cafeteria and how we're, students are waiting for the bus or, or being on a bus or going on a field trip, right? Um, the next piece is around those rich instructional experiences um, that really in, intentionally uh, have incorporate strategies to support motivation, competence, self-directed uh, learning and require higher order thinking, right? To the extent that we can help students um, have their three psychological needs met, right? That autonomy, competence, relatedness, how often are students experiencing that as opposed to experiencing school in this very outdated model of empty vessels waiting to be filled with information from the all knowing adults in the building, right? That's a very outdated, uh, conception of how learning happens. And now this new research on how learning and development happens, we have an obligation to design and craft learning experiences that really help students practice and experience school in that way. And then finally, um, this idea of integrated and yet individualized supports that address student needs um, and, and can attend to and notice the effects of trauma and adversity, um, not bulldozing through and saying, well, you're at school, leave your, leave your baggage at the door, you're coming here to do this. No, how do we attend to and notice the whole child and then create and adapt and respond to needs as they show up? So let's dive into each one of these a little bit more uh, in depth. So again, uh, this positive developmental relationships, Katie talked a lot about this already, but just some of the research behind this is kind of fascinating for me too, right? So research says that students who um, feel connected to at least one adult um, are more likely to attend and graduate from school, more likely to attach to learning, succeed academically, when they feel there's a strong, trusting, supportive connection to an adult. Um, so developing these relationships can be difficult in schools where organizational structures minimize the opportunities for personalized relationships that extend over time. So again, this is the, this is the factory model, right? We're not necessarily set up as a structure to notice and attend to the individual needs of each child, nor are there really enough adults sometimes it seems to, to provide those sorts of um, relationships. So it's incumbent upon our schools and the way they organize to really leverage every adult in the be beginning uh, in the school building from the beginning of the day to after school time to really think about how can we make sure every kid is connected. Um, there's some there's a lot of practices that some schools use and I mentioned this one earlier but advisory uh, advisory classrooms um, looping that is having the same teacher or um, you know over multiple years creating smaller lear learning communities um, I know one thing I did when I was a school principal we looked at our students um, the students that were having the hardest time succeeding in school. These are the kids that were either chronically absent or more, most likely to get detention or be suspended. And we took all those names and it was about 50 kids. And with every single staff member on our campus, cafeteria staff, 
security officer, like every single person who worked in our building, I said, everyone find a kid who you have a connection to. It wasn't relegated to just teachers or just administrators. I wanted everybody to have a role in this. And sure enough, everybody had someone, right? The kid that I maybe didn't connect to connected really well with the cafeteria woman. And they, and that became the person that would be like that anchor for the student when they were feeling dysregulated or feeling frustrated or not wanting to come in. And so we intentionally built those structures to build those relationships, especially for students who felt like they didn't have that connection to anyone. We can go to the next slide. And so um, in terms of the environments filled with safety and belonging, we know that learning is a process in which both students and teachers must learn how to understand and communicate with each other and in which trust creates those conditions for reduced anxiety and greater motivation. So I don't know if you're like me, if you've ever gotten in an argument with someone or been really frustrated um, or angry, and then you sit down and try and read something and you find yourself reading the same sentence over and over and over again, you're like, gosh, I can't focus. And that's because your amygdala is engaged in some emotional reaction. Um, I think sometimes the shorthand might be that people say your amygdala has been hijacked, right? It's because your limbic system is responding to a stressful moment and is saying, hey, this is not the time to be engaging in higher order thinking. It's the same rationale behind if you're, um, if you're in the woods and you see a bear walk by your path, you don't start doing geometry to figure out, you know, okay, if point A to point B is approximately six feet, I can run three miles an hour, how fast should I get from my tent to the car to measure? No, your body goes into automatic response to decide how best to keep you alive in that moment, right? And it's the same sort of idea. So uh, we have to think about creating environments that are um, defined as sensitive and attuned to students' emotional needs. Um, that we're consistent, trustworthy, and cognitively stimulating. So it's not just the emotional aspect, but also finding ways to tap into providing higher order thinking experiences that are engaging. You know, um, I, I, I think about some of the things that stand out to me are um, creating shared norms or creating uh, daily classroom meetings. Um, can you notice when kids are frustrated or upset about something that's happening out in the world? Do you just ignore it or do you pause and say, hey, we need to address this thing that just happened. Um, let's take a few moments. Let's process this together. Let's ask some questions. Let's express our emotions. You get that out of the way. And just as Katie explained, you reduce that cortisol, you increase that oxytocin, and sure enough, you're back at a place where you can engage in that critical thinking, right? So those routines, um, creating a sense of community, celebrating one another. Um, Eduardo, I think you mentioned that, like we celebrate birthdays and we ask how we're doing and we play those games. Building those connections helps to add to that sense of safety and belonging in the climate and culture of the classroom or the, the school environment kind of writ large. Um, the next piece here is around um, the uh, integrated supports, right? So effective school environments take a systematic approach to promoting children's development in all facets of the school day and in its connections to the community, to family, to caregivers, right? In the same way that adversity and trauma occur in all communities, so does healthy development. Right, so this uh, well-designed supports, and including those specific programs and intervention, interventions that can buffer children against excessive stress uh, can ex enable resilience and success for children who have faced serious adversity and trauma. Um, a key aspect of creating the sort of uh, supportive environment and integrated support is, is might be thinking about how we do multi-tiered systems of support, right? What does our NTSS system look like? How do we respond uh, to needs as they show up, both social, emotional, uh, behavioral, academic, interpersonal, right? The, the structures that we create should have, have a plan for, a routine for, and a structure that has a way to respond to all of those things that come up. Um, yeah, and this is a key developmental framework for 
uh, for not just children, but adults as well, right? Because we are human beings, it turns out, and we have needs as well. And in, in thinking about how we can support one another, especially in this moment, post, I don't know if we're post pandemic, I got excited for a moment. And then I realized maybe that was too hopeful, but mid pandemic, uh, hopefully post pandemic in the coming years, but we have to think about our, our teams, our adults, right? We're asking teachers and staff and uh, service providers to do so much um, with their time. And how might we create those parallel structures for the grownups that we also know that the kids need as well, right? Um, we can go to that next one. And so finally here around the skills, uh, mindsets and habits, um, social emotional learning is for all of us, right? It's not something we're ever done with. Um, we are not ever completely, you know, we don't turn 18 and think, okay, we're great. We're fully developed socially, emotionally competent people uh, with all the skills, habits, and mindsets we need to survive. It's, it's, a, it's a practice. It's something we have to continually engage in. Um, and we also know that SEL is not just like, oh, it's your character building. It's also how you attend to the, to the aspects of, uh, of curriculum. It's how you engage with others. It, it's how, um, how you focus your attention. It's how you make choices. It's how you organize your time. All skills, you know, these are those 21st century skills, right? It's, 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 it's the thing that employers are calling for more of in their future, in, in employees that are applying for jobs. I think um, it's a process that it occurs in many contexts, right? Home, school, and community. And I think too often the assumption is that, oh, well, SEL is something that should happen, you know, at home. That's, that's the parent's job. I'm not a parent. That's not my job. Well, if your job is to teach children, then your job is to understand emotions and to understand feelings and the role that all of those play in learning. Um, and if you don't understand the connections of that science to how learning happens, then you're missing an opportunity to really actually mutually reinforce and, um, and, and create exponential Kind of lasting learning experiences for students. Um, anyway, it's integral for all learning, and I think I'm likely preaching to the the main choir here uh, with this audience. And we can go to the next one. Um, I, I touched on a little bit on, on the rich instructional experiences earlier, and um, not to spend too much time on that here, but just really thinking about um, how we can give students choice and voice and agency, right? What tasks can be given to them where they get to go down a, a line of inquiry that fascinates them, um, exposing them to new, new things, new history, new experiences, new ways of thinking and being, and then let them have some agency around where they wanna go with it. Obviously within some parameters, within some structure, it's not willy nilly, but it really is about how to help them experience that state of flow. I don't know about you, if you've ever been doing something or working on something where you're in this psychological state of there's no time, is this has the sunset? I haven't even eaten food today, right? Very few children actually experience that in K-12 education. And imagine how many kids would be much more invested in learning and developing in that regard cognitively if we set up learning experiences where they could experience that, right? And so finding ways to build that in um, into the school day, into the after school day um, are incredibly important, right? And also having conversations, especially, um, I have a six-year-old who is very much in the why stage. Every single thing he asks me about, he wants to know why. And why is that? And why, 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 right? And I find myself I'm like, God, I need to know a lot about a lot of random things um, to keep him satiated, right? Um, but but when we get when we're talking about adolescence, right? This is a perfect time. Um, to really draw on the adolescent inclination around fairness and justice and understanding rules and engagement and civic engagement and how our government and all of these things work, right? So the, the idea is how can we connect the type of learning experiences that we're offering for kids with the developmental stage that they're at and really finding that sweet spot um, to help them feel like, hey, this is something that I'm enjoying. I'm really good at it. I'm asked to elaborate, question, and go down these lines of inquiry that can draw them in 
to feeling capable so that the, that being a student and being a scholar um, becomes part of their identity and how they see themselves. And then our job is a whole lot easier as a school, right? Because we're not trying to drag them along. They are part of this and this is a part of who, who they are and how they see themselves. Um, and so we can go to the next slide, Katie. Um, all together, right? Um, bringing all the science together in a coherent way, that's the trick. That's the thing that's hard about this, right? And how, um, how do LEAs account for and plan for all of these critically important elements within the many constraints of finances and personnel and the time of day and the school year constraints and unions and all the right, there's so many factors that can play into the making this very difficult. But if you can, if you only take away a couple of things from this today, it, it would really be, it would really be these. So next slide. One, uh, education has not traditionally been set up to support the interconnected way our brains work and the social interactions that reinforce and support our learning, right? We have to acknowledge that this factory that we're, we're living within is not conducive to, to the way that we know learning happens right now. And so we have to be thinking about how can we push for and leverage what we know about this science to find ways to tweak and adjust and adapt our system uh, to actually be more congruent with what we know, the ways children learn and develop. Next slide. The other thing we know is that students develop through all their environments, right? There's not just one environment, not just one context that students are moving in and out of, right? There's lots. Um, and to the extent that we can find ways to pull in their experiences, to validate their identities, to um, help them see themselves in the things that we do and the language we use and the way that we celebrate different cultures and identities to, to the extent that we can help bring those things together in a more congruent fashion and that's not just asking kids to assimilate or asking them to leave their culture at home but how do we bring that in and really highlight and utilize that experience in a way that they can move more fluidly through all of these different contexts that they're in, it, that's where we end up with the real power of learning, right? And I think um, one thing that comes up for me a, a lot is that expanded learning partners, expanded learning after school, um, support providers and uh, coaches and teachers and uh, aides, they have long known the importance of blending social emotional learning with other activities, other rich experiences, right? Um, and, and so I just wanna do a, like a very big nod to the expanded learning community who have been preaching this and doing this work for an exceptionally long time. And I'm so excited that the, the, the K-12 kind of in the school day folks are finally coming around to seeing that this is how children learn. So I would say y'all have been ahead of your time for quite some time. Uh, the, the next piece really is just, um, you know, the brain is malleable. Uh, as Katie mentioned, I, I don't know if you said this, Katie, in this session, but the brain is the most malleable tissue in our body. It's not our biceps. It's certainly not my abs. I know that for sure. Um, but you know, the, the brain has so much ability to change and develop. Um, and that just tells us that kids have the potential to learn and grow. And I think that also means for me and us is that we also have the ability to learn and grow and develop and take in and receive feedback and continually find ways to improve. And I think um, to the extent that we can show kids that we are human also, like, oh, I'm really frustrated by the way you're behaving right now. I am, I'm really having a hard time. I need a moment to breathe. Right. If we can model that for students and help them see that we are not these perfect people that are have been tasked like we're we're not fully baked either. We never will be. That helps show them that this is how you work through challenges as you're growing and developing. Um, and 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 next, it would be that emotions and social interactions are not separate from learning. Right. Emotions. Uh, uh, Mary Helen Imordino Yang is a neuro. Um, what's an affective neuroscientist? I can't remember her title, but she did studies emotions at USC. Um, and she says that emotions are the rudder that drive thinking, right? So if we want, if our goal is to have ki kids thinking, 
then we have to engage the, emo the, the, the emotions as well. They are not separate. Um, if you've ever met a mathematician who's obsessed with math, they'll, they'll describe a formula as beautiful, right? You can't appreciate beauty. You can't be disgusted by something without engaging the emotions, right? So we have to be cognizant of, of the power of that. And then finally, um, right, just to bring it full circle, uh, the path to learning is a calm brain, right? Um, We're all experiencing an incredibly disruptive context right now. Um, we need to focus on helping students experience calm brains, finding a way to utilize and identify strategies that work for them, right? So just at the top of this, we talked about what things do you do to cope? We all have something a little bit different, but what we've done is over the years, we've practiced a lot of things that either worked or didn't. So maybe eating an entire loaf of bread or an entire box of cookies doesn't work for you. It worked for me in the beginning of the pandemic. It's not working so much anymore. Like I need to walk more often, take more phone calls on, on the phone and walk while I'm doing that, right? So we, part of growing up and developing is figuring out what works for you to get yourself back to that regulation. In the meantime, we as adults, can help students co-regulate. We can be that anchor for them. We can help them work through that tunnel, tunnel of emotions while they start to practice different strategies that work for them so that as they are old, getting older through our system and becoming our future citizens with us in this world, they have a, a basket of strategies that they can draw on to actually support themselves and reach know when and how to reach out for help when they need it. Um, and that's about it for me at this moment. I know we're gonna shift gears and talk a little bit more about, uh, about the impl implications for practice, but I've just talked at you for quite some time and I feel like I wanna open it up maybe for a question or a comment or a thought. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Shauna. That's like a performance art piece. I don't know, every time she does that, I'm like, so glued. So thank you very much for that. Um, I have a suggestion so that folks have a chance to really talk about this. What if you and I go into, we just do two breakouts and then you and I go into them. Would that be that good? Works. That way people can really talk. Um, so we're going to do that. We're going to do two breakouts. You'll have one of us in there. And actually, Shauna, you and I, we could, we could hop around a little if you want. That sounds good. Let's do that. We'll do, we'll do what we'll go in with you and we'll stay for a little bit and then go to the other one. Cool. I just opened two rooms. <laughs> oh, I didn't say what to talk about. <laughs> I didn't either. I think we're just going to debrief. I think. Okay. Um, I'll go to room two. You, you wanna... have, you have, um, the question so we, you can flip frame it. Okay. You're going to room two. I can No, go to room one. Cause you sent me to room two. Oh, I did. I didn't realize I'm in there. Okay. Bye. And then you can leave whenever you want and come when, when we see each other, we'll flip flop. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, anyone besides me and Shauna want to share out any thoughts from your chats? There were such good conversations in both rooms. How do we create this new utopia? Uh, we're going to need someone to champion the idea. We need to uh, have people who are invested in it that want to do it. Uh, we put a lot of resources into a particular school where we did restorative practices and I can go to that school and it's, it has a whole different culture mm -hmm. and vibe now. So it's clear that if you put the time and energy into something and people are invested, it can create what you're after. So, but, you know, teachers are used to oh yeah, here's the new program. This is how we're going to teach math these few years. And then a new program comes along. So uh, how do we impact that resignation and, you know, really move forward with the possibility that we see is, is available to us here? Well, that is why we're doing this presentation, Rocky. <laughs> All right, we I have everything like, I need. <laughs> we would like more people to have this information and to be knowing about it. So now we have you eight, nine people thinking about this differently. Um, I'm doing this all in as many 
basically county offices and districts as I can, just talking about this. And I'm going to share with you in a minute a whole set of tools that are freely available. Um, but it is a matter of each of you taking information from here and thinking about how it fits in your context and what you do with it and what you do. So Tommy gave a very specific example, I think that was in the breakout room, about you, Tommy, let me not speak for you. Would you like to share your specific example of what you might do within your role? Yeah, I was just saying that uh, Think Together, we partner with 50 school districts in the state of California. We serve like 450 individual schools. Uh, so that means that we have champions in, in a lot of places where uh, we can partner with that champion and create a forum just to talk about this. Right. I mean, we don't need to be talking about what Think Together does after school or before school or whatever the case. This is what we should be talking about uh, in as many places as we can have those conversations. Um, and I'm excited to start that endeavor with our teams, Harlan Smiling, because we'll start there. Awesome. OK, I'm going to um, so that I just realized what time it was so we can get you out on time. I'm going to share a couple of resources with you. Um, so most immediately, as in tomorrow, <laughs> we're doing a, Shauna and I are doing a presentation through the Sacramento County Office of Education. This is, we've been doing a four-part series on the supports that um, schools need to put in place next year as students return, well now, and next year as students return into the learning space. So um, we've been talking about relationships. Um, tomorrow we'll be talking about routines, and then finally we'll be talking about resilience. Um, so if you wanna join that, Shauna just put, I think in the chat box, the link to this session, which is two hours long, involves tools, things like that. Um, so that's one thing that's a resource coming up immediately. The other is um, Turnaround just released a toolbox, which is full of specific and practical, well, both the framing for whole child design, which is super exciting to me because I shared in one group that people don't know how to do whole child design they don't know what that means. I didn't know what it meant until I joined Turnaround and got this very concrete set of structures and tools and practices that people could do to do whole child learning. It actually exists. So I invite you to check out the toolbox, which has, again, the science grounding, but also specific tools teachers and educators can use with kids. Further Turnaround resources. The well-being index is like a pulse survey on how kids are doing. Um, it's about how they're feeling and it's also about how they're functioning. Um, and it's intended to be used frequently so you can get a sense of like how specific kids are doing and provide the supports that they may need um, when they haven't told you that they may need supports. Um, and then finally, um, we have this, what we call um, the crisis action pack, which is about when kids are actually in crisis, what are the things you need to put in place in order to support them, which um, may, may be unfortunately more of an issue um, this summer and next year as, as kids kind of surface from wherever they've been. Um, so uh, as we leave each other, I'm gonna ask you for time's sake, I think I'll just have you put in the chat box, what's something you'll take away with you today just to share in our community. Um, and I really appreciate your time today. Um, it's been, I love that we got to go into groups with you and have a conversation. Um, and I uh, appreciate the spirit with which everyone has entered into this. Shauna, you wanna say some final words? Uh, yeah, I just, Rocky, I'm fascinated by the question you posed, but like, well, how do we actually do this? And I, one thing that comes up for me is around what we're talking about here in a lot of ways is culture change, right? And that transformation of our culture about what we value, what's most important, what's our vision, what's our mission. If, if all of those statements and sentiments can, can actually include all of this science and include this approach and orientation to how children learn and develop in school, then, then as curriculum come and go and a new adoption comes and goes and new teachers and staff come and go, that actually remains steady 
And, and we can be sure that this will become how we do things here. Just like that, the culture shift you talked about at the school that adopted the restorative practices, like that's just how they are now, right? If we can, if we can do that and bake that into who we are as educators, um, I think that's, that's where the change happens from, from the, those of us in the field on the ground with the children every day. And then we work on the other people who make the decisions also. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you. Shawna, you want to pause the recording? Hey, Katie. Thanks, Shawna.